Hey there, Dave Philida, Scanning Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is an edition of Huck TV Missing People. Yes, friends, you are at the right place. Unfortunately, we are getting known to be the channel that talks about missing people. Where are they? What happened? Missing people in the wilderness. And, uh, I am the author of a series of books called Missing 411. There's 11 of them now. Do not buy the books on Amazon. You'll get ripped off. You'll pay three, four, five times what they charge, what we charge on our online store. And uh, the link to the store is on here. But uh, in case you want to go to the store right now, it's NA, NA like North America, NABigfootSearch.com. Go to the store and you'll find my books. And you will see the link on the store to get premier movie tickets to our get together November 12th in Tempe, Arizona. It's at a beautiful museum. Uh, we're going to have a big crowd there based on the sales. Uh, I don't know how long tickets are going to last, so you might want to gobble them up, but it's going to be huge. And this is not a normal Missing 411 documentary. This is way different than what you've seen in the past. Missing 411, the UFO connection. So uh, I hope I see you guys there. The weather in Montana took a big turn in the last two days. We went from 83 degrees the other day to 60 today and rain. So fall is definitely on the way. Surprisingly, we have not had very many missing people this season in Montana, which is a good thing. I do know that many, many more of you are carrying personal locator beacons. Uh, a little device about the size of your phone, put in your backpack and you activate it when you're missing and search and rescue will come and find you. It's based on satellite technology. I've stated before that Apple 14, that rendition of the phone is going to have a, an emergency texting option on it great technology so uh, we're slowly getting there and the words getting out I wish everybody every hiker in the world carried one now at the beginning of these segments I always read a few letters from people and some of you get really upset so I want you to understand something my primary message here is hiker safety, safety in the wilderness, and educate people about how and why people go missing. Some of you say, well, Dave's not a Christian because he, he talks and he reads letters that aren't Christian related. Friends, there are people out there that aren't Christians today that may be tomorrow. And if you talk angry to them or you turn them off and you don't listen, they're never going to migrate to the Christianity side. So I'm going to allow those people to talk, say their piece. I've never said that I'm going to believe what they're saying. I am a Christian. And as I've told many people before, I was raised a Mormon. And I actually feel sorry for people that get so angry and want to turn me off because I allow other people to talk. I think that we'd be a lot better off as a world if we patiently listened to each other to understand rather than listen to get angry or listen to respond. Listening for a sympathetic ear and acknowledging that you're willing to sit down and listen to the other side, where's the harm? If you're solid in your beliefs, then nothing's going to sway you. And if you're afraid that they're going to promote some demonology or uh, allow the devil to talk, again, if you're solid in your beliefs, don't worry. I'm not. So enough about that. Had some very angry responses from some people 
about me continually, and you don't see many of these because I take them all down, as many as I can get to, about people getting real angry about me talking mental health every once in a while. I don't care. We're going to keep talking about it. Because I probably have a hundred responses in the last two years from people that say I helped them survive a period because I was willing to talk about mental health or um, it gave them coping skills in dealing with mental health. If I've saved one person's life, all of this is worth it. All of it. So the people out there that have such a great life that you don't need to hear about mental health and you don't need to hear the plight of other people who are challenged today. That's great for you. But I think there's a great portion of society right now that are challenged day to day. I'm one of those people. I'm no different than you. I have really great days and I have really, really horrible days. For the people out there who have lost somebody significant in their life, certain things will hit you in the face and remind you of that person and drag you down to the gutter to such a low point it's beyond understanding. Certain songs I hear remind me of Ben. And they'll just drag me down and I'll be depressed for at least three or four hours. Yeah, it's hard. And I know, I know what it's like because I know other people are going through it. So, I'm in your corner. That's not going to change. Let's get to some of these letters that talk directly to what I was saying. Mr. Politis, this is the first time I've ever taken the time to write to anyone besides the IRS. I watch your channel every day. Your message of compassion and dedication to your work and your family has inspired me to do better. When I see you, I think to myself, another day with Uncle Dave. You feel like family. I'm humbled. I'm humbled that you would say that. Thank you. It's also important to me that, you know, I make it a point to think of Ben. Every Tuesday and Wednesday nights when I play hockey, I too am a defenseman like Ben. I try to call upon his energy to skate with me. Wow. So he can still enjoy the ice. I know how much that means to you, so I had to let you know. Seriously, thank you for helping me reestablish my trust in God and love for fellow man. If you ever have doubts about what you're doing, remember, Sweet Will says you're doing the most important research to ever be done, so you must carry on. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words about Ben. Next letter. Hey Dave, I know you're still having a hard time since Ben's passing. I know with Ben taking his own life, that makes it harder. I lost my son 30 years ago. He'd been ill most of his life and passed at 19. In some ways, because he had always been ill, I was blessed. I was forewarned, you might say. And while we were prepared, you're never ready to lose a child. My soul screamed for years that this was wrong. Parents are not meant to outlive their child. But bad things happen to good people all the time, and God was still there, even when I wasn't so sure that I wanted him to be. I was pissed for a while. I got over it. I don't want to be angry with God, but I was. I still don't understand the full meaning or significance of it all. That makes two of us. But I can tell you that no one taught me more about life, living, and dying in faith than my son did. 30 years later, he could still bring me to tears. Not as often. The memories are bittersweet. Don't feel guilty. Don't wonder if there wasn't one or more things that you could have done. Trust me, there wasn't. You were a great dad with a great relationship with your son. There's nothing that can take that away from you. you never quite get over it. 
But that isn't entirely a bad thing. It does get easier. Thank you for never giving up on the missing 411 cases. Hopefully one day we will have more answers and questions. Thank you. Like I said, good days, bad days. It's a question about Bigfoot DNA, topic that Ben, ben loved to discuss. I've followed your work for several years and I find it to be quite interesting. Most recently, I listened to an interview you did on Coast to Coast with George Knapp years ago about DNA research. Based on the information provided, I wanted to pose two questions which may be of helpful in your investigation. The non intended challenge is study findings, they are intended to anticipate questions that will likely be raised by the scientific community. I'm not an anthropologist, but I studied anthropology as an undergrad and graduate student and have a strong background in the discipline. All the same, I'm open-minded about the boundaries of current knowledge. If I understood correctly, the conclusions put forth by the DNA study suggested that the hair samples texted were from a subspecies of modern humans, which were likely diverged sometimes 12, the answer is 12 to 15,000 years ago. One, is this degree of evolutionary change possible in such a short period of time? No, don't think so. On an evolutionary scale, 15,000 years is relatively insignificant. Yep, I agree. If these beings are descended from modern humans, most anthropologists would argue that this is too short of a time to account for the extraordinary description differences reported. The morphology of the creatures in these reports is remarkably consistent. Seven to eight feet tall, covered with thick hair, massively built, likely weighing over 600 pounds. Correct. And I don't, I don't believe it is evolution. I don't know anybody in our group that does think. I think it's something outside that interjected. Huck finding a deer outside. If this subspecies... Hey, Huck! Shh! If this subspecies evolved from modern humans... They have grown 12 to 24 inches in height and achieved 300% increase in body mass over a period of just 15,000 years. A transformation on this scale would be unprecedented, especially in humans. Agreed. Case in point, the morphological changes observed between Homo hybrogenesis and modern humans occurred over three to 400,000 years and are relatively insignificant. What other plausible explanations could there be? Could there be an error in the data? Nope. Could the point of divergence actually be older? Nope. I think the conventional theory for Sasquatch phenomena that these creatures are surviving human ancestor, while still extraordinary, would be more plausible than most anthropologists. B, if this rapid evolutionary change is not the result of natural processes, then it was artificially accelerated. Admittedly, this opens a giant paradox, but we don't have many points left. If you're interested, I'd be happy to discuss further. Well, you missed a big point here. So, it wasn't hair, it was in the nuclear DNA we found this. And remember, only half of the DNA could be identified. Never in Gen Bank's history could they not identify the male part of the DNA. It's never happened. Well, if it's never happened, then it's not from Earth. It means it's something else. It's come from somewhere else. Now, obviously, I've told everybody that you can go to that our study on anybigfootsearch.com and read all about it for free. And then you can read Scott Carpenter's books and he's really drilled it down and made it easy to understand for the commoner. So, no, it's, to believe it's some type of evolutionary change would not be logical. Which is why nobody in Mainstream science will touch this topic. Next letter. Hey Dave, first my uh, condolences to you and your family for the loss of Ben. I've done a lot of research on NDE and those that come back always say that there's no time where they are and they see it as we are right behind them. If we could conceive how many close to the next world is, we would take comfort knowing that no one is ever really separated. However, we get caught up in the physical world and that we must exist on until we pass over. I will try not to ramble as I have much experience with other worldly things and I could go on. I just want to share this picture I took with you. If you wish to show it to the world, feel free. 
I'm not sure how it will be received. If I hadn't taken it with my own camera, I might not believe my eyes. Here's a brief on how the picture came to be. So, let me show it to you. There's a man sitting here in some type of rock or brick wall, sitting here looking this way. And out here is this orb. The way the picture is, it elongated it and made it appear oval. And in reality, the picture, it was a circle. But this was not there when the picture was taken. They never saw it. They took the picture and it showed up. I was living in South Langley, British Columbia, Canada, in a horse and farm country. Rented an apartment on a 10-acre place, and this picture was taken in autumn of 2008. The fellow in the picture was my neighbor. He lived at, at the front, and I lived at the back. This night, he was sitting on his porch having a beer, and I was standing in the driveway taking pictures of the sky. There was a full moon, and the sky was wide open. With, without planning to, I turned and snapped a couple of pictures of Clint sitting on the porch. He had just very recently lost his mother to an illness. When I took the picture, I did not see these orbs. The place where these orbs are was solid bush, nothing for light to bounce off. I didn't see the orbs until I reviewed the pictures and I was shocked. When I showed the picture to Clint, I said I thought it could be his late mother visiting as he was very depressed at her passing. I thought maybe she was watching over him. As I said, I took a couple pictures of him, but only this one picture of these orbs was in it. After listening to you read the letter about the orb the fellow saw in his yard, it made me think maybe this wasn't his mother. I really appreciate all you're doing to bring the platform to this world. The amount of missing people is just mind-boggling. I can't believe that they all got lost and can't be found. Thank you, and please keep up the excellent work. I can't imagine how hard some days must be for you. I hope you can find some peace in knowing that one day we'll all be together and we just need to finish our race doing the best we can. I enjoy all the letters that others send as I like to hear people's stories. I also think that what you are doing about suicide awareness is very important. I did not realize the staggering statistics until you brought this to light. The news doesn't, the news doesn't report it. Don't stop praying. I don't stop praying. And uh, we have a very, very close relative that lived in that zone where the hurricane hit in Florida. Praying for him and his partner. Disastrous. And uh, it will be years before that area recovers. And with the issues of supply chain, getting equipment, getting construction materials, it could be really bad. And the expense of rebuilding now with interest rates so high, wow, I, I don't, I don't wish ill will on those people. In fact, they need all the prayers that they can get at this point. Next letter. Hey Dave, if any of these missing bodies are returned or their belongings are found, maybe they should be tested with a Geiger counter to check radiation levels. If it's connected to the UFO phenomena and these people are being taken from the sky, maybe radiation levels should be checked. Just a thought. Understand. But I want you guys to really understand something on my end. When people go missing, nobody in search and rescue, unless you're watching this show, think about associated factors like we're talking about today. Nobody. They take it as a standard missing person. Uh, they send people out like you and me or, that are trained search and rescue people. And we go out and we try to find the people. And if we find them, we bring them to um, medical services. We have them checked and we go on our way and we go home. That's it. There's none of this radiation checks, nothing like that. Nobody, nobody thinks along those lines. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, especially in the odd cases. But we're gonna talk about some things today involving some of the cases I'm gonna tell you about 
that there is definitely some odd stuff going on. So, yeah. I understand why you'd ask the question, but search and rescue people never think that way. Next one. Hey Dave, after hearing you speak of those strange lights that have been appearing all over, I've determined to write you concerning experiences I had two nights in a row. It was during the winter of 2020 and on a very cold and clear night when I'd been out stargazing. Our part of Maine is a great place to do so because we have a clear atmosphere and near zero light pollution. I'm seeing, let me tell you, quick story. I've been to Maine a couple times, hockey related, of course. And uh, that state is just beautiful. Uh, driving up part of the coast, gorgeous, uh, going inland, gorgeous, and uh, people were all super friendly. I'd, I'd definitely like to go back to Maine someday. I'm seeing nothing unusual until I notice a light off to the east, larger than a star and changing colors white, red, and blue. I thought it was moving slowly in a zigzag pattern off to the south, so I took up a solid position. It was low to the horizon and everything was covered in snow, so even by starlight I could see it changing position in relationship to the treetops, lining an intervening ridge. It moved back and forth, sometimes up and down, until I got cold and went inside. The next night was a repeat performance, except what I call my neighbor, a former military pilot, and asked him to observe. The next day he came to see me, thinking that perhaps we had been the victims of autokinesis. I told him no, that I'd watch the light move in a relationship to the ground objects. Then, as he put it, there's been a lot of flying objects seen in this part of the state through the years. But Dave, that I should include this experience the wife and I had last night, September 25th. 2022 between 11:30 and 12:30 had been raining and cloudy here yesterday so the day was spent around the house by late evening all seemed normal except for some possible thunderstorms in the area our bedrooms on the second floor so we both went up and tuned in or turned in about 10:30 which is later than usual both of us were laying on our left sides back to the window which faces east we usually go to sleep in this manner due to the pole mounted led light about 100 feet away which shines through our window is the only such light in a small community, so it's very dark out here. Stop there for a sec. So when I lived in Colorado, one of the things I really loved was standing on my deck and watching thunderstorms. And we had some beauties in Colorado. Don't have so many anymore out here in Montana. Ha! Ah, what are you doing? She's out there in the hallway looking at me. Dad, come play. But one of the things I tell everyone is thunderstorms, pay attention. A lot of people report seeing unusual objects in the sky in and around thunderstorms. True. Suddenly a bright flash startled me right through my closed eyelids. It had done the same to my wife. I asked, was that lightning? But neither of us thought it was. The weather had been unseasonably warm and so the window was raised about a foot. My hearing isn't great, but the light rainfall hitting the steel roof of our porch just outside the window was audible. Over the next 30 minutes or so, this flash happened three times. After that, I got out of bed and went to the window. Our driveway is 135 yards long and lined with large sugar maples. The nearest one's about 40 feet from the window. I stood there at the window for a while, watching and listening, but heard nothing more than the light rain. I continued looking out to the east-southeast directly toward the nearest maple when a bright flash went off again. It appeared roughly circular and I'd guess three to four feet in diameter. Strangely, it seemed as though the light was somehow contained and focused. It was pure white. The best way I can describe the intensity is to say my first thought was a flash bulb of an old-style camera. The ones like the studio used that are so hot you can smell the ozone after each flash. The duration was equally as short as an old-style flashbulb, just an instant. The brightness of the flash blinded me for a second, but what amazed me was what occurred between myself and the maple tree. There was no sound associated with the flash. I went downstairs and out on the porch, but saw nothing unusual. Turning my good ear to the south, I could faintly hear rolling thunder in the distance, but no lightning strikes. I returned to bed and had a conversation with the wife about what had just happened. We had resumed our usual positions for some time before being startled yet again through closed eyes. 
That's pretty weird. The two of us were totally baffled. I woke this morning to learn that my dear cousin, who had suffered a massive stroke several months ago, had passed. I think they put 1 a.m. on his death certificate. I don't believe in ghosts. I just don't have any answers for what I saw. And Dave, I don't know whether this would qualify as an orb, but have you or anyone in the village ever heard or seen anything intensely bright flash like that before? Your work's important. Our prayers are with you. Maine. Never have experienced anything like that. I've seen a lot of weird things in the sky. And I probably have heard something similar to that before. But that's pretty weird. Got to tell you. So, next one. Hey, Dave, I want to say thank you very much for your dedication to mental health. It truly saved me more times than I can count. Whenever I'm in a bad place mentally, I listen to your videos and I'm instantly in a different, better mindset. Humbled. Thank you. It gives me more fuel for my soul to keep going to hear those things. I have multiple experiences with fully pitch black being or entity in and around a creek I lived as a kid. I have brought five other friends with me over a span of six years in which they all witnessed what I witnessed. First time I saw the shadow, I was with two friends walking the creek bed while it was dried up. After walking to a nearby bridge, looking around at the graffiti art, we decided to head back to my house. After a few minutes of walking, one of my friends looks in the woods and about five feet in elevation to our right, he sees he freezes in place and takes a look at me and my other friend. Without a word, he darts towards the the direction of my house. About a minute later, we catch up to ask him what was wrong. He told us that a pitch black human figure was watching us from behind a tree and hid when he looked at it. We got spooked and started walking back towards my house. When about five minutes later, I got an uneasy feeling that we were being watched. So I turned around and saw the entity watching us behind a fallen tree. And when I looked at it, it ducked. That confirmed that my friend was telling the truth, so we ran as fast as we could to the entrance of the creek without looking back. At the entrance, we all looked at the creek one last time to make sure we weren't followed when my other friend, who, wasn't, who hadn't seen the entity yet, saw the entity on the opposite side of the bank waving at him. Me and my other friend didn't realize it until a while later when we brought up the event. Over the years, we've seen the entity by the lakes, by my house, and in the creek on multiple occasions, just watching us from a distance. The most freaky sighting was when we went in the creek looking for clay. I heard a loud crunch in the woods behind us. I turned around and saw on the other side of the tree line something pitch black hunching over and walking towards us. Definitely the closest it's ever been, probably five to ten feet away. This is the only area I've seen an entity that was pitch black. Other times the apparitions were very t detailed and see-through. Wow. <laughs> I wouldn't like seeing that, especially that close. Like, what exactly are you seeing? I don't know. I don't know if that could be good. If I was the parents and I had kids seeing that kind of stuff, I'd move. Hey Dave, before I get into my story, I just want to say thank you for the content you create. I first learned about Missing 411 back in 2016 when a friend introduced me, and I've been hooked ever since. I am a landscape and astrophotographer who enjoys solitude in nature, and your content and message helped me be more prepared for my adventures. Here's the story. Some brief background. I grew up on the prairies of Beulah, North Dakota, and my dad and I would deer hunt a lot when I was a kid. The specific spot I'm talking about in this story is a large area of land that the local coal mine turned into a public game refuge after mining. So this area has some thick wooded areas while also providing hiking skiing trails for people. It's also a great location for hunting. The phenomena that happened to me took place not once but twice back in September 2008 when I was about 11 years old. I had my deer stand set up on the edge of a tree line and my dad had his stand set up just a ways down further, maybe a quarter mile. The weather was great, a beautiful evening. After a while, I heard a voice from deep in the forest. 
It was my dad's voice calling my name. It sent a chill up my spine. I thought maybe my dad had harvested a deer and was trying to find my stand or something. I'd never heard of missing 411, so I made the mistake of calling back and I yelled back something like, yeah, dad, no reply. Later when dark fell, my dad picked me up and asked, and I asked him why he was yelling at me earlier. He had no idea what I was talking about. The crazy part, it happened again. But this time I was hunting with a family friend who had a deer stand in another area of the game refuge. Same thing. I heard my name being called from the deep forest, only this time it wasn't my dad's voice, it was the guy who I was hunting with. Now this friend is very comical and a joking person, but when I asked him why he called my name earlier, he looked at me dead serious and said he had no idea what I was talking about. I never saw anything. I was never harmed, nor my dad or friend, just voices. But the fact that it happened twice in the span of maybe a couple weeks or so is just wild. Thanks for taking the time to read this. Blessings to you and Huck. Well, thank you. So, let me get to something that you should understand. I've had a lot of friends, I'm gonna grab some. I've had a lot of friends in the Bigfoot world that have had things happen to them just like you explained. And most of the time, it's always Bigfoot related, always. And in uh, Hoopa Project and in Tribal Bigfoot, I printed an article that was in the Oregonian newspaper in the early 1920s. And it talked about a series of three groups of Indians, Native Americans, that had a press conference to talk about these creatures. And they called them another tribe of people. And they, were, they said that they were excellent at mimicking anything. I thought that was fascinating. And they said a lot of other things. But whenever I hear stories like just that, it makes me think of exactly that. It has to be Bigfoot related. Now, it's to get into the stories here. The first story, in an area of other disappearances I've written about, and that's in uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, kind of near Donner Lake. And it involved a man, 40 years old, named Sidney Warner. We're missing October 22nd, 1946, in the morning hours. He was originally from the city of Colfax. And he was staying at the Soda Springs Hotel. And he was employed by a company and a man named Paul Norvo as a Christmas tree cutter and he was working on the side of Devil's Peak, about three and a half miles from the hotel. And this location is just south of Cascade and Long Lakes, and probably a half mile or less from Long Lake. Now, the map is important here, and I'm gonna go to it a couple times. So, this is Donner Lake. Everyone's heard of the Donner Party. This is Sugar Bowl Ski Resort. I skied at it 50 times in my life. And I'll talk about this in a second. But this is Soda Springs. It's another ski resort. And it's along the main highway on the north side going to North Shore Lake Tahoe. And then this is Devil's Peak. And it's about three and a half miles from the hotel. And it's right off this area of all these lakes. And that's where they were cutting trees. So, he doesn't show up one day. And they thought he was out late and he was going to be into the room. He didn't show up. He never came back the night before. So on October 22nd, the owner of the hotel, uh, Dennis Jones, reported Sidney missing to the Placer County Sheriff, whose name was E.J. Kennison. Well, Kennison took it seriously. And he called the owner of the company, Norvo, and he says, hey, I want to use all your men, and I want to search for Sydney." He said, absolutely. And then he also called one of his reserve deputies who had a plane, and for 1946, having a plane, that was pretty prestigious. And he says, hey, I want you to fly this area looking for this missing tree cutter. Now, when you look at this area 
on Google Maps and you turn it to a satellite look, there's granite everywhere. And that's this, that's this part of the area of what it looks like. And if you go further south from this location, you go into a place called Desolation Valley Wilderness Area. And Desolation Valley is famous for having tons of granite, lots of cool lakes, cool rivers, great fishing, spooky, <laughs> lots of Bigfoot activity. So, anyhow, they do this all out search. The search went on for weeks, folks. And for 1946, that's impressive. Now, during those weeks, some people said that they had seen Sydney. Some, some person made a claim that he stepped into their cabin. Some people said he was evading searchers. Some people said he lost his mind. But there was one common theme here. He wasn't found. He was never found. Several years later, his name was listed in an article because they found some remains in the area where he disappeared and they thought maybe they were his and it turned out they were not. But remember, he disappeared in an area called Devil's Peak. Well, I wrote a book called Missing 411, The Devil's in the Detail. And that word devil shows up in a lot of locations where people disappear. Now, trying to understand how someplace gets a name is really hard. Unless it's named for somebody in history. But why would this area get a name of Devil's Peak? Was there a sighting in this area of something that was odd? I don't know. But let me give it to you here. So, Soda Springs. It's about three and a half air miles to Devil's Peak. This is Sugar Bowl. It's about two, two and a half miles to Sugar Bowl air miles. And very famous case I wrote about of a skier that was at Sugar Bowl and just vanished while he was on the lift. He was a former military man. And they thought, okay, well, he'll turn up in the spring when it all melts. And during the spring, there was a giant search. He never turned up. He was never found. Very similar to what happened to Sydney. Now, in that same area that I just showed you, Soda Springs, Boreal Mountain, Kingvale, etc., a friend of mine wrote a book. And the book is called Aliens in the Forest, written by Ruben Uriarty and Noe Torres. It's this book. Let me read you what's on the back, because this happened right in the area I just told you about, where Sydney disappeared. So for the first time ever, the eyewitnesses in one of the world's most intriguing and least known UFO cases reveals all of the terrifying details of his encounter with alien beings in a dark forest near Cisco Grove, California. In the fall of 64, 26-year-old Donald Shrum stepped into the Tahoe National Forest, looking forward to a relaxing weekend of bow hunting with two buddies from work. Let me stop right there. I've said this before. More hunters disappear bow hunting than any other type of hunting. And this guy was bow hunting. Little did Trump suspect that within hours he'd be locked in a horrific 12-hour struggle with aliens that seemed to be bent on carrying him away to a fate worse than death. Authors Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarty are investigators with MUFON. They've collaborated on three books about famous cases. This work has been featured on the History Channel. It's an interesting book. And uh, I don't know Noe, but I do know Ruben really well. And he's a super credible individual who uh, I trust his research impeccably. So the story with this is these guys go hunting. They get separated. Sound familiar? And Shrum gets chased by some of these aliens actually up a tree. And he worked for a missile manufacturer. For years, he was reluctant to say anything. And then he finally did. And then they put it to print. 
that's right in this same area. That's what's weird. And remember a while back, you, everybody who I asked that responded said, yeah, Dave, give us the background information on these areas. So there's part of the background information on this area. The other part of it is, is that I personally, when I lived in California, went to this area over Bigfoot sightings. Uh, this is way before uh, Ruben wrote the book Aliens in the Forest. But uh, yeah, very busy area for Bigfoot sightings. So that's your story on And those disappearances, and that would be along Highway 80. It's a big four-lane highway from uh, Sacramento to, it bypasses North Shore Lake Tahoe and heads into Reno. Next story, a Canadian story. A man is named Henry Storr, 55 years old. He went missing August 16th, 1948 just west of a place called Castlegar, British Columbia. It was a logger. Now, on August 16th, 1948, he was given a ride by another trucker and dropped one mile from a, his logging camp where he was staying and living. And he was employed by a company called Hearn Lumber. Well, he was due there that night. Some friends of his got a hold of the ride and they said, no, we dropped him off. When he hadn't arrived in that one mile away camp, by the next morning, the loggers got together and searched, and they searched for the whole day. That would be August 17th. They couldn't find him. Then they got a hold of the RCMP. And the RCMP brought in resources from throughout this part of Canada, which is very rural still. And back in 1948, it must have been really remote. So, they started to search the woods and they found some indication that he stepped into the woods rather than staying on the road directly to camp, which everyone thought was very odd because he had been to this camp many times. And what they found troubled everyone. They found pieces of his clothing along a path. It, it was unclear whether this was ripped off by the environment, trees, bushes, or whether something else had torn it off. It was unclear. But it was scattered throughout the woods along a trail where they thought they'd find him. Now this location was off a place called McCormick Creek. And McCormick Creek dumped into a very big river up there. Let me show you the map here. So, this is the U.S. Canadian border. This is the border of Idaho, Washington. This is where the incident happened up on McCormick Creek, just west of Castlegar. Now, the search went on for a week and they found several pieces of clothes. They couldn't understand why they, were, why they weren't finding him. Until they ran out of resources, ran out of time, they gave up. Henry was never found. My friends, that makes no sense at all. Again, a logger is somebody who is very adept at the woods. They're very comfortable being alone in the woods. He had worked for this company for a number of months. He knew the road to the camp. The idea that he voluntarily walked off the road into the woods makes zero sense. So let me talk to you about the proximity of this. So disappeared in McCormick Creek. It's 30 air miles across the border into a place down here west of Medellin Falls where a little boy disappeared. And he was with his mom, his two other brothers, who went to a waterfall to look. I've written extensively about this case in my Missing 411 books. 
Mom said, hey, wait right here. I'm going to be right back with the boys because this boy didn't have anything on his feet. So the ground was real rugged. So he said, yeah, I'll wait here, Mom. And the brothers and the mom went in, started look, looked at the waterfall. We're gone just a few minutes, come back, and he's gone. Well, it's a logging road that he was standing on that was closed, and there's no traffic up and down it. There were big logs across it, so nothing could have come across at that time. Well, no one heard, heard a car, no one heard any noises, no one heard anything. There was a massive search for this boy. Massive search in the woods. Never found. Yeah. So, again, McCormick Creek. Across BC, probably about 31 miles from this incident, is Wendell, BC. Just south of Wendell, man's hunting with some friends. Tells his friends he doesn't feel very well, and he's going to slowly start heading back. He slowly starts heading back, and he doesn't, he doesn't show up at the spot where they agreed to meet. He had hunted this area many times before. Week-long search, never found. Well, that's pretty discouraging, Dave. Now, one more case. So we got one two, three, four cases in this square with the Canadian border as a split. Step into Idaho. I've told you, friends, these disappearances, country lines, state lines, don't mean anything. Number two that I have listed here is number two is a case out of uh, Priest Lake, Idaho. Absolutely gorgeous place. <laughs> Absolutely, unbelievably beautiful. So... Older man, in his late 60s, early 70s, excellent health, with his wife, had lived in the area for decades. Actually had had a house in the area for decades, lived in another part of the state, but came there on vacation regularly. They were out huckleberry picking. Yes, huckleberry picking. And they got separated somehow. I've been in this area. Not a lot of big trees. A lot of low ground cover. When Angie and I were in there, we were very careful because a lot of bear, a lot of big bear up there. But they get separated. The wife eventually makes it down the mountain because he had the keys to the car. The truck was still parked there. She makes it down. Huge search. Goes on for days. He's never found. So what we got, so we got four cases all within a pretty defined area there that's troublesome folks because things like that aren't supposed to happen and we as a society if those people are there you should be able to find them so let's go on to the next case so first of all uh, the first case i told you about sydney warner we're missing in 1946. Next case, 1948. This case, 1927. Simon Teeple, 40 years old, missing February 1st. Another timber worker. He was employed by a lumber camp seven miles west of, of Mission, Michigan, on the upper peninsula of Michigan. And the lumber camp that he was working at was near a place called Dollar Settlement. Well, Simon decided that uh, after work he was going to make it back to his residence in Mission. And after he already started the hike, it started to snow. Well, he didn't arrive in Mission. And friends and co-workers organized. And within a couple days, they had 30 people and teams looking for him. The trail, they know where he started from camp, they found some small twigs and branches a couple miles out where they thought he might have tried to start a, a fire. Well, the tracks that they found headed deeper into the woods towards his ultimate location, and they stayed on it. Well, they went on and they searched for days, and eventually on February 12th, a blizzard stopped the search, and it snowed several inches. 
Well, they knew Simon didn't smoke, and they didn't think he had cig uh, matches, but they weren't sure. Now, Michigan State Police and the U.S. Coast Guard contributed resources to help finding Simon. On February 14th, they started a second search for him, and they found that all the tracks that they had seen originally were obliterated by, obviously, the snow that fell. Now, there was a... Altogether, it was almost two and a half weeks of searching. Simon was never found. He was never found in the years after the disappearance. So, that Upper Peninsula area of Michigan going into Canada, <laughs> spooky. Now, Lake Superior up here. This is the border of the U.S. and Canada. Sault Ste. Marie. And he left this location near Dollar Settlement. He was going to make it seven miles to Mission. Kinross Air Force Base. It's now Kinross Charter Township and an airport. Do you remember what I told you happened here? Let me remind you. An Air Force jet was scrambled from here and flew up over into Lake Superior. And they were asked to be scrambled by the Canadian government about a UFO that was seen flying from east to west over Lake Superior. So the pilot and his co-pilot went in, they got close to it, and the radar instruments said that there was a storm in that area, and they showed that the two points coming together, and then the Air Force jet disappearing. Air Force jet was never found. True story. And I did an extensive video about that and I, I hope you watch it it's right here on this channel so the area all the way through here going way off the map and going down here to mackinac island all surrounded by islands uh, surrounded by water on three sides has a series of people missing including a cluster of missing people near Newberry, which is just west of that location off the map. So the Michigan UP has a couple different clusters of missing. Kinross has the location where the jet took off chasing and disappeared. There's a scattering of other disappearances all through Michigan UP. And I gotta say that Michigan is one of the strangest states I've written about over the years for unusual disappearances of airline jets. An airliner disappeared off the uh, western end of southern Michigan, never was found. Planes have disappeared in the same area, never found. Air Force fighter jet disappears and is never found. And then a series of hunters, hikers, cross-country skier I wrote about that disappeared. Yeah, Michigan is a very strange place. And there has been undoubtedly tons of Bigfoot sightings in Michigan, north to south, east to west. What can I tell you? I'm not going to ignore the topic. I'll just tell you what the facts are. So, there's three cases, folks, and I've given you some peripheral information about all of them. And there's no embellishment, just the facts. When these cases are around other cases in, in that cluster scenario, it has to really f make us focus on what's different about that area than others where there maybe are no cases. As an example, the middle of the Nevada, state of Nevada, there's almost no cases. There's Area 51, but there's really no cases of missing people. But then logically apply your mind to that and say, well, probably not going to be a lot of people hiking in the middle of no place Arizona desert, because that's pretty unusual. So it's hard to get missing people when there are no people there recreating, 
right? So that's one of the areas where there's no cases. But then north to south through the middle of the US, I've talked about this many times, there's almost no cases. And that makes no sense because there are people. Now, in our movie, I hit this topic head on, straight up. Why aren't there any cases right there? And I give you a very, very big theory. In the movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. And that theory comes together with multiple points of contact that I think are mind bending. And uh, it'll cause a lot of you to think differently about this topic, I believe. So, Huck just walked in the room, decided to say hello. She's been out there protecting our yard. Thank you, dear. And people have asked, was well, Huck a boy or a girl? Well, Huck's a girl. I know she has kind of a guy name, but but why does she have a guy's name, Dave? <laughs> this is a story. So when we went out, we went to this ranch in Montana, and it was a big ranch, and they were raising Pyrenees because the Pyrenees at this ranch guard the property. And one of the girl dogs had puppies, and they're running all over, and we were there, and this one dog kept running up to me, jumping on my lap, little puppy, and licking me, and it's like, that's got to be the dog. And I said, yeah, we're looking for a, a male. And I, I said, I haven't looked yet. And the owner says, yeah, we only have two females. All the rest are males. That's a male. I said, okay. We didn't even check. Whatever. So two or three days later, it, it doesn't matter. Two or three days later, I'm at home and the puppy's on its back and I'm rubbing its tummy. I go, hey, Ange, come over here. I go, I don't think this is a male. She goes, Oh, that's a lot of mail. We already named her Huck. We love her just as much. It doesn't matter. In some ways, it is better because she's not going to be huge, giant Pyrenees like some of the males get. Uh, she's going to be a, a little dainty thing, probably just a little under 100 pounds. Um, last year, I was at Home Depot. This is in the middle of winter, like 15 degrees out. And I walked by this truck, and in the back of the truck were these two great Pyrenees. They were the biggest dogs I'd ever seen. They had to be close to 200 pounds. They had huge manes around their head. You could tell that the dogs lived outside their whole life. Friendliest dogs you ever want to see. I wish I would have taken a picture because it just, they made Huck look like a little dainty thing. But anyhow, that's the reason that Huck has a male name, but she's a female. So anyhow, friends, thanks for being here. I appreciate you watching the videos. Please put this out on your social media and share it. Um, and especially the trailer. Please share that trailer with even your friends and family and say, hey, you know the guy who made that movie. Yeah, yeah you know me. It's Dave. I know the guy, so he wanted me to show it to you and watch the trailer. It would just help to get it out and get views on it. In the meantime, be careful out there. The world's a dangerous place. Know that you're cared about. Know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. And even if you're having a bad day in life, go out and do something for someone else. Because you know what that'll do? That'll bring you up. It'll cheer you up to see a smile on somebody's face. So even as low as you think you're going to ever get, always turn that scenario around and try to help somebody else. Thanks for being here. I'm very grateful and humbled. Huck and Politis out.